Hey, babe. What are we talking about today? I'm really excited because today we are sitting down with Lauren and James Barrett. Fun fact, I used to work with James, which is how this relationship got started. And then we got introduced to his amazing better half, Lauren, (laughs) in the process. Yeah. (laughs) And today we are going to talk about their adoption journey as part of our finances and fertility segment. So thank you, James and Lauren, for being with us today. Yeah, thank you for yeah, having thank us. Yeah, thank you for having us. We're, we're really excited. Absolutely. Well, let me get into these bios because Lauren does all the things and you guys need to know about it. James does less things, but again, that's why we're calling her the better half. Yeah. So we have that in common. You do all the things and I do a lot less. There you <laughs> go. Her back is always hurting. Oh, so. okay. It is actually <laughs> same, same girl, same. Um, so let's get into it and then we'll get into this adoption journey because I know our listeners want to know all about it. Lauren Barrett is a multi passionate mom working to help all parents become their best selves and build positive relationships with their kids through mindful parenting. She has a degree in deaf education and a master's in reading education. She is a high school teacher of the deaf and hard of hearing a cross-country coach, a writer, author, whose works have been featured on Pop Sugar, Scary Mommy, Her View from Home, and more. Of course, she is a proud mom. James Barrett is an implementation manager in the tech space. As a career Southerner with a love-hate relationship with hot weather, despite sweltering summers, he enjoys baseball, game nights, and cookouts. One of James's favorite pastimes is listening to different financial philosophies, and constantly obsessing over his Roth IRA, 401k, (laughs) brokerage accounts, and day trading aspirations. Lauren and James are parents to their son, Henry, and have begun their adoption journey, which we are here to talk about today. So thank you again for being with us today. Thank you. you. So Lauren, we know you have um, a unique, I don't want to call it perspective, but a unique situation, which has kind of been the catalyst for this adoption journey, right? Mm -hmm. Because obviously you have Henry, who is so adorable. Mm -hmm. And to my understanding, that was just a natural birth experience, Mm -hmm. right? Okay. So no IVF or no infertility issues at that time? Nope. First try. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) All right. So now you're in this adoption journey. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us why? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so while I was pregnant with Henry, um, I found out, well, I knew that I had a brain aneurysm, but kind of, we found out it was in a little bit more of a dangerous spot, um, and that it might've grown. So I had Henry via C-section, no problem. Um, and then I had a follow-up it's called an angiogram, it kind of takes a little bit deeper look at the um, aneurysm. And then that's when they determined that I would need surgery, had successful surgery, but they said you cannot get pregnant because um, you're on this type of medicine. We have to make sure that the aneurysm goes away. Um, so that was about a two year wait. And then um, and that's when we started to try to get pregnant again and we were unsuccessful. Um, went, met with the infertility doctors, um, and we both kind of have some stuff going on. So that's why we decided to adopt. Okay. So first of all, how did you feel when you found out that you had a brain aneurysm? Like, how did you even know to get <laughs> something checked out? Because isn't mm-hmm. it that typically people are not that lucky to know that they're ha- that they have one, right? Yeah. So um, walk us through that. <laughs> Yeah, so um, my family has a family history of them. Um, My aunt had a mini stroke, was fine, but while they were looking into the stroke, they found that she had an aneurysm, and then that's when everyone in our family got checked out. So the first time I got checked out, um, I didn't have any. Um, Five years later, I went to go get checked again. And that's when they discovered that I had one. So I found out I had one in 2015. Um, never really thought much about it until I got pregnant. And I was like, oh, I probably should go see somebody, like a specialist. Because I went in for my e- yearly scans 
And they're always like, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. But I never really talked to a neurologist and I was always kind of like wondering why I didn't, wasn't talking to one. <laughs> so when I was <laughs> I made sure to go see one. Um, and so, yeah, so yeah, now I just have to get um, yearly. Well, I'm on five years now. So every five years I have to get checked. My mom actually like has three of them. Oh, oh geez. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that was a family thing. Mm -hmm. So this is just me being ignorant. I I thought mm -hmm. it was like a fluke, right? Like a fluky mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. Not something that, oh, if you have a family history, like you can get checked and monitor yeah. it. So that's really, that's a great call out because I had no idea. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I cut you off. Oh, no, like the first thing that comes in my mind mm -hmm. is like from a health insurance standpoint, like how do they view that? Like. Mm. What is the cost associated with that? that? Ooh, because I, you know me. I mean, I, I saw. That. <laughs> yes, we do. So, so this actually happened the same year that we had Henry when she had the surgery. So we were already at our out of pocket maximum. So I was like, I was pushing her do this in December, do this in December. Yeah. Uh, and she did, and we had zero pay. Now, when I read the actual bill, it was like one hundred twenty five thousand dollars surgery. So I was like. I'm glad she's okay, but score because we're already. <laughs> I, like, I had the surgery December 27. Yeah, it was wow. Win-win. She got you know the care and the attention that she needed, and you know naturally, even if we weren't out of pocket, we wouldn't have paid 125k. Yeah. We would have paid a portion, so it was a win-win for me. Wow. But it's always interesting to like to keep in perspective, you know, if you don't have insurance, because so many people don't have insurance for, you know, very valid reasons, you know, that yeah, are maybe yeah. outside their control. But one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars, like, yeah, for I surgery you have like, to have, right? It wasn't an elective procedure. You're like, oh, I want to tweak my nose a little. I mean, <laughs> no shade to anybody spending money on any of that. Right. But like this is like, no, we have to do this. So mm -hmm. that's it's we had Roman in October. He had his vasectomy in December. Same thing. We were like, get it on the books. Let's go. So healthy boy, snip, snip. Here we the go. <laughs> but this, that doesn't count because the vasectomy was not covered. It was an elective surgery. Which is so ridiculous. So, it was, so that actually does not count. Again, we insurance did, is a scam. I did pay for that. Yeah. <laughs> Such a scam. Okay. So you had the surgery. I'm so glad everything is okay. Yeah. They said not to have another baby. Was that before the surgery or did they also advise that after the surgery? And you were like, no, we're just going to try anyway. I knew going into the surgery that I would have to wait some time before we were allowed to try again. Okay. Um, so that's where the two year period. Yeah. I think it, it, correct me if I'm wrong. You were saying like the medication would have prevented um, you from getting pregnant. That's why they said you need to wait. Well, they said it was kind of a, a dangerous yeah. medicine. I think it would have made gotcha. it risky. Yeah. Gotcha. And, I had to have three follow-up angiograms to make sure that the anu uh, aneurysm had shrunk or disappeared. So they, while they were in the process of that, they wanted to make sure it was totally gone before I, because, you know, pregnancy is stressful. And I, I think maybe is. my pregnancy is what caused the aneurysm to grow. Um, because okay. before it was all measuring smaller, and then when they checked it during pregnancy, they had noticed that it had grown. So it okay. could have been the pregnancy that caused it wow. to grow. Mm -hmm. We all know pregnancy does a lot of crazy things mm -hmm. to our bodies, so it wouldn't be surprising. <laughs> okay. okay, so thank you for that background because that's, A, I learned that it's could be hereditary, so I'm sure our listeners are all like, oh, I didn't know no, that either. My aunt has them, my mom has them, my grandparents had them. Um, wow. I think I'm the only grandchild that had that has it um but yeah like henry will have to get checked okay how how soon can they check children for the for them oh that's a good question i did ask that but i think they said not to worry about it now okay so got it, it. Mm -hmm. okay so now you're here you have henry you're healthy mm -hmm. and you're ready to grow your family why did you choose adoption versus like surrogacy, for example? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was going to say probably price. Oh, yeah. That, that, was, that was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, for us, we've never specifically cared whether the child was biologically ours. So that's not really the big deal. It was all about, you know, we want to, you know, grow our family through any means necessary that makes financial sense for us. So, 
you know, uh, surrogacy, when I think about it in my mind, that just pops in like, I feel like it pops in a, uh, an economic cast that we're not really a part of. <laughs> and so I'm thinking like, uh, surrogacy. I know people who have paid like, not know people, but I've seen prices upwards of like $75,000. And I know that's just not in any ballpark that we can swing where, you know, from the adoption standpoint, we can take a child who would not have had a home otherwise and then give them him or her a loving, uh, loving home. Mm-hmm. Also for me, um, so we thought about embryo adoption for yeah. a little bit, yeah. oh. but with the history of the brain aneurysms, my pregnancy was pretty rough. Um, I have an autoimmune disease. I just kind of was like, I feel like ugh, pregnancy is, I'm just <laughs> kind of like putting it Been aside. there, done that, check yeah. the box, don't need to do it again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm with you. I always, even growing up, I always always knew I wanted to be a parent, but Mm -hmm. I also knew that I didn't want to be pregnant. And I know it's (laughs) such a blessing Mm -hmm. when you want to have children to get pregnant without any Mm -hmm. issues. And we didn't have any issues. It was like two babies, two pregnancies, all good. And I know now that's such a blessing, right? Growing up, you just think like, this is what your body's made for. And you hear all the stories about like, if you look at a boy wrong, you're going to get pregnant. And it's like, well, now as an adult, we know that it's actually much harder and your window is very small. And Mm -hmm. yes, it is a huge blessing when you can just naturally conceive. Um, But in my head, I'm like, Ooh, surrogate sounds nice. Like (laughs) you get your baby, your body doesn't change. Like I had heartburn and carpal tunnel and like things that you don't ever even hear about. And I'm like, why do that? I think you say that in theory. I know. You can be a slight I'm such control, a control freak. freak. I know. It would. I'd be like, "What'd you eat today? How much water did you have?" It would not be. It would not have been good for me mentally or our surrogate. But you know, in theory, you're like, "Oh, Chloe Kardashian did it the right way." Just ask me a thousand questions a day. I can only imagine how many questions she would ask a surrogate. <laughs> yeah, poor surrogate. No, it it was better that we didn't go that route. So, but we also talked about like. Because I don't have a thyroid, that causes issues in itself. I definitely have some autoimmune things. And so we very early on in our relationship also talked about like, okay, if this doesn't happen for us, what would we do? And we always came back to adoption. So we are, we're two and done. Um, so it's great to hear about your experience and to learn more about the process and what you've been learning along the way. So um, can you talk to us about, so you decided adoption and then What are you thinking? Domestic, international, open, closed, like walk us through all of those things, because I know there's a lot to consider. Also, I think a lot of people don't even know what those terms necessarily mean as far as open and closed. Oh, yeah. Do you want to do you want us to walk? Do you want to walk through that? Yeah, sure. So we are doing a domestic open adoption. Um, So a domestic means in the United States. So our child can come from any state in America. Um, and open means that we are open to having a relationship with the birth mother. Um, so open can look like meeting in person every year, or it can be a just sending letters back and forth. We kind of, kind of see what the birth mother is feeling. Um, so that is open. And also with, um, domestic adoption, there's private adoption and public adoption, and we are going the private route. So that means that the birth mother is choosing the agency and choosing us um, to be parents. Whereas public adoption, it's more like the child is being released. The mother no longer has the rights with a public adoption. Oh. And the question I obviously, once again, what does that look like? You know, is there a difference in, you know, Price, cost point for the two different ones. Yeah, so private is more expensive. Um, public um, public adoption or public agency usually is with older children where we are adopting a baby infant. So would that f- then f- fall under like maybe a foster to adopt if it's an older child and the mother or the, the parents don't have... I guess custody of the children, and then the state releases them. Am I making this up, or is that no, no, no? You're, you're right on. Yeah. Okay. So, what went into you determining that you wanted an open adoption, that you wanted it to be private? 
How did you decide on those factors? Because those are obviously really important. Yeah, so I think, uh, at least from my perspective, we knew that a private adoption would, you know, give us more success on having a, like a, an infant or a smaller kid. And I originally, I don't think you know this, I originally thought a closed adoption was the best route to go. But then I did some research on the psychology of those who have been adopted in closed adoptions, and they have zero connection to their biological heritage. And that, you know, obviously has ramifications as you grow up when you ask, where do I come from? Or just, just questions that any child would ask. And if your parent can't answer, then it's like, oh, I'm just, I exist in a void almost. So when I did my research and found out that a lot of those, you know, you know, kids as they grew up naturally had some just, you know, psychological problems and, and hard adjusting and feeling like they don't belong, then I realized, you know, public adoption is is not public, sorry, a uh, open adoption would be probably the better route for the child just to make sure that, you know, we're their, we're their parents, but they still need to know and understand where they where they technically come from. Yeah. Would it be safe to say also that, you know, the difference between a open and close is that with um, the closed scenarios, it could be more often that the child is being removed and not necessarily, you know, I guess. Well, maybe the mom, maybe the parent is like, this is too hard for me to have or maintain this kind of a relationship. Because isn't there also semi open where it's like you might get pictures or letters like once a year to for the parent to know like, Hey, my child is doing well. This is how they're growing, but I, I want to be removed from the situation. Right. Yeah. I guess in my head, you please correct me if I'm wrong. It, it kind of is a spectrum, if you will, where you can say, I want an open adoption and that open adoption may end up being more closed because, you know, emotions happen as a mother has a child and maybe they thought they could handle being able to have communications, but ultimately decide, you know what, I can't, you know, emotionally do this right now at least. And it can become even more open later. Or you could, I, I think from a close, it is just close where there is like zero con, you don't have any contact information of, the, you know, of the birth parent, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So on our, we have to make an adoption profile and website. And on the website, we have to put that we are open to openness. Um, and then <laughs> the, we kind of follow the birth mother's lead and what she's feeling. But birth, uh, open adoption is actually becoming more common. And I think it actually is more common than closed adoption now when it comes to adopting okay. privately. Mm-hmm. It makes total sense based on what you said, James, right? Like, I can't imagine walking through the world and being like, where do I come from? And I know now I actually have a couple of friends who have found their birth parents through like Ancestry.com and 23andMe, but technically, you know, their adoptions were closed. They found siblings and half siblings. Um, I know somebody who found their um, their half sibling that they knew their their mother had put up for adoption when they were a teenager, right? And like now they actually are are really close and they've integrated that person back into the family. And so, you know, if you can skip all of that, right? And instead of the child being 20 or 18 or whenever they can then reach out and try to actually do that research Mm -hmm. to help them feel more whole, I think that is really wonderful. I follow um, a girl on Instagram who's adopted twins and I know that they've had an open adoption and she shares um whenever it's you know a holiday or the twins birthdays that the the bio mom is what they call her um you know is there and she gets to take pictures and you know but Mm -hmm. they've they seem to have established really clear boundaries and it seems to be a really healthy relationship for everybody involved so I think it it's it looks like it can be really beautiful if you I guess Mm -hmm. do it the right way and everybody's comfortable so yeah, yeah talk, talk to us about so you said you wanted a baby is there an age range so you're like 12 months and under like what is a baby for you first off it's birth birth to three months yeah i was gonna say zero to, to three okay. months zero. all right so no babies over three months that's like mm-hmm. off the list yes okay mm-hmm. how do you make the determinations for other things because james you're black Lauren, you're white. For those that Henry, aren't watching. <laughs> yeah. Henry is obviously a beautiful mixed brown boy. 
what do you envision for your family and, and what kind of criteria did you put in place or were you able to put in place for this mm-hmm. adoption? Yeah. So they literally go through every single race and combination imaginable and say, are you open to this? Are you open to this? And we, we talked and we want the child to look like he or she came from us, kind of like Henry. So we're open to biracial. Yeah. Black yeah, definitely. And black. Yeah. We, we didn't really like, like I mentioned earlier, we don't care if the you know the child doesn't have our genes or whatnot, mm-hmm. but I have know people who have been in what's called transracial adoptions where both parents are either or at least one parent is completely different race than the uh, than the child and, and I've heard just some of the struggles that they had growing up and not you know again that sense of belonging not feeling like they belong in either or uh, so I at least at least for me I, I was really big on making sure that we had a, a brown of some of some huge child <laughs> yeah <laughs> I mean, when I said before we had our kids, you know, we talked about, you know, the possibility if we had to go the adoption route. And I kind of said to her, I was like, I, if we were going to adopt a child, child's got to be brown. Like, you know, he's like, I'm not walking through Target with some blonde child for some Karen to come up to me to talk about me taking some kid. It was a whole thing. He had a lot of big feelings. I was not, I was not, I I didn't want to be harassed for having, for walking around my own child. Right. And it's, I mean, it's valid. And we have friends who the, the dad's black, but he has, you know, uh, you know, biological blonde hair, blue eyed kid. And we've talked about some of the looks he gets when he goes in public mm-hmm. just with that child. And, you know, that's his bio kid. It's like I can only imagine, you know, a different scenario. Yeah. And also for us, too, you know, it's from a statistic standpoint, it. You know, it's shown that, you know, brown children, black children are adopted less often. And so we were like, you know, if we're going to go that route, we are going to look for a brown or black child because they aren't the ones that are adopted often so yeah i mean you're right i i was just googling you know in the very earlier process and it was it was kind of heartbreaking to see on google saying like you know brown and black kid adoption is less than you know a a white kid's adoption i was like that's a very sad stat yeah it's so heartbreaking yeah i mean obviously i mixed He's light, but black. <laughs> and our children are both are both mixed, um, different shades, but they both have green eyes. And, you know, I mean, yeah, we've just talked about the world we live in and not ha- like, why put yourself in a scenario where you could be questioned? And I know him. I know my husband. That's not going to go well for the other party, right? Like he's at the grocery store picking up muffins and somebody wants to question if that's your child, biological or otherwise, right? It's just not going to go well for you. I also so. like to clarify, like, <laughs> I'm sorry, but black people are not, you know, kidnapping kids that aren't their own and then oh. taking them to Whole Foods or Trader Joe's. <laughs> that's, that's very not fair. Not, very, <laughs> not a thing. <laughs> it's not happening. It's not happening. But then you look at the opposite, right? Like, I mean, literally anytime I walk into Target, You are bound to see a white mom with a little black child, if not two. If you go to the parks in our area, white moms, black children, which great. Thank you for adopting children that need homes. I hope you're doing what you need to, to, again, like you said, James, make sure that they understand where they come from, open, closed adoption. Otherwise, whatever that looks like, they clearly have a background and a heritage that is not like yours. So are you educating them? But nobody's questioning them. People look at them with like, you know, the white savior eyes and it's like, Oh, they adopted the Brown kid. That's so nice. But then you flip it and it's like, you're getting questioned and stopped in public. Right. So again, the disparity is real. So I have a question. Like, so when, so once you get to the point of where you guys have already decided, you know, all the details of the type of adoption you want to have. What is like the qualification process that they have in regards to making sure obviously that you're fit to adopt a child? A lot. A lot. Yeah. Uh, walk us through, yeah, walk there, us through that. <laughs> there is a, a, a ton of paperwork that you have to go through. You have to get clearances. You have to get, FBI. you have to get your fingerprints. <laughs> uh, then it's sent to the FBI. You have to get your fingerprints. They do a local search. So we just went up to, uh, are the local jail for Wake County and they, you know, run your fingerprints and then, and then you send those fingerprints on to the SBI and then they do like the state search. So yeah, you, there's a lot of, cl- and then there's two additional clearances. 
one being like the sex offender, sex offender and then one being child like abuse yeah registry. child abuse registry which is handled i believe by uh Our home the home study firm yeah so there's a lot you you have there's so many times we you need, sign your name <laughs> we need medical like a mortgage but more <laughs> yeah no, yeah i'd say yeah definitely more intrusive than a mortgage for sure yeah, we need medical statements from all of like Henry's doctor, our doctors, his employment statements. Um, yesterday we had our home study, so they came to our house, they inspected it to make sure it was up to code, we were safe, and then we each had an interview with the social worker, and she asked us about our ba- our background, our childhood, uh, our siblings, our parents their employment you know, just a lot of questions and we're not even done we have to have a joint interview coming up with the my home goodness study. That sounds so that's like a home study and we have with the agency we have to create a website we have to create a printed profile and we have to do a video we're at the video we we are at the cre- need to create a video stage right now so mm-hmm. okay. uh yeah we're trying so to I find the po- I saw the picture you guys had posted that you were using on the website, and that was yeah, a great picture. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. do yeah. you have like? Did you have to come up with this checklist of? I've got to get my fingerprints. I've got to send them here. I've got to send them there. I've got to, like. Is that something that you created on your own, or did the agency give that to you, and you're just kind of going through and checking the boxes? Yeah, exactly. The latter on the agency website, they have everything that you need for each phase or stage, if you will, the adoption and everything is, you know, you know, it's got an open box. You need to check it and then upload the actual document to correspond to that box. So like it's still outlined very well, but obviously it's still a lot. (laughs) Out of, you know, the private agencies that are out there, how did you select the one that you're working with? It's funny that so. I looked up adoption a while back when we were first having fertility issues. uh, And I actually looked up like, you know, you know, best interracial adoption adoption firm. And it led me to a website that was a I didn't know at the time, a third party subsidiary of the private firm that we actually ended up going with. So when Lauren started doing some additional research, we found out like, oh, they're the they're one and the same. Oh, okay, this this is like serendipitous, if you will. This makes sense for us to proceed with these with these people. And they were highly reviewed on a lot of other like non-affiliated websites with, you know, so we thought like, okay, this is, if we're going to do this, we want to make sure we're not doing it with someone who does like, you know, one or two adoptions a month. We want to make sure we're going with someone who knows exactly what they are doing. They can educate us on the ins and outs and where the pitfalls and speed bumps potentially are. Mm -hmm. Did you also (laughs) completely kind of like a little bit of a tangent Uh, What was that Netflix thing that we watched in reference to the adoption agency that was splitting up like twins or whatever? Oh, Our Father? Well, it was on Our Father, wasn't it? But then it was like they talked about studies that were happening. We watched a Netflix special with an adoption agency where they were taking siblings. This was like in the 60s and and 70s. Putting them in different homes. Oh, like. A better home or a lesser home to see, like, is it nurture versus nature? Oh, really? It was. Oh, that's so that wrong. Was, yes, yeah. it was so wrong. And then it was. Oh, oh, we'll have to find it and link in the in the show notes. But it ended up being they separated triplets. Remember, they ended up. Oh being no, no, I, I did hear about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't seen any of the documentary. But I did hear about. You know, them did I know at least one passed away, right? Well, one of them, like what the, the initial, um, like one that they were focusing on initially was, um, they they ended up running into each other at college. Right. Yes. yes. They ended yes. up going to the same college, yes. and someone was like, and one of them had like one personality, and one had the other, and so like girls were coming and kissing one of the guys on the cheek, and he was like, why are these random girls coming up to kiss me? But it's because his one of his <laughs> brothers had already been there and like established these relationships. It was kind of yeah, wild. And they do like we'll a deeper, it. yeah, they do like a deeper dive and they find that the agency has done this for years. So with twins and yeah. And multiples. Obviously so, that's not the situation you have. But <laughs> just what kind of thing. Lauren asked, was the name of it Dear Evan? Was that it? Or did we just, did I'm she, not sure. All right. All right. We kind of is. have an idea of what you're talking about from a while back where I, I think I read a story on it. I was like, well, that's, it's kind of wild, but yeah. We'll find out and we'll put it in the show notes and I'll message you about it. Because it was it was really interesting. I mean, terrible, right? What this agency was doing, but obviously well, you want to go with somebody reputable. So our agency really tries to put siblings 
together. Yeah, that's one of the yes. questions that they ask. Are you open to twins or triplets? Or sibling groups. Yeah, sibling groups because they want to make sure they stay together. Okay. Actually, that is a, is a good segue because I wanted to ask, um, from my understanding, you have to fill out a ton of paperwork on what you will and will not accept, right? So like mm-hmm. if the child has drugs or alcohol in their system, if they've come from, you know, an abusive situation, if like, I mean, literally every scenario that you could possibly think of or that's been on SVU is on a sheet, right? And you basically are like, yes, no, yes, no. So can you dive into that a little bit? And how does that factor into like, if somebody called you through this process and said, hey, we've got a baby girl, she meets all of these criteria except for this. Like how how have you guys decided where your hard stops are, right? Like, yes, we will accept this or no, we won't accept this. Yeah. Well, the um, once we go through all of our preferences, the agency is not going to match us with any birth mother that doesn't fit our preferences. Okay. At all. Um, and I think for me, coming up with the preferences was kind of uncomfortable, honestly, when you think about it. Like, you yeah. naturally- It's mean, unnatural. Yeah, yeah. Like who who would actively say, yes, I want a child who has fetal alcohol syndrome or I want a child with a mother who has a history of schizophrenia. But at the same time, you're like, I want to nurture and love a child. So it's like it it's very uncomfortable to say, like, I'm picking and choosing the toppings on a pizza is kind of what it felt like. And mm-hmm. we, we just had to really sit and talk and, and really uh, like be in agreement on, you know, ultimately, what are we looking for for our family? Mm-hmm. Yeah. We kind of have a delicate situation where we do already have a child, so we have to think about you know yeah. too. Yeah. Have you guys had any um, bump head moments through that process where one of you felt strongly one way and the other person was like kind of standing their ground and saying, "I'm not willing to budge," <laughs> or were you like very in sync the entire time? No, we, we've had bump head moments, uh, none on like the actual box you check or choices in the adoption. It's more like getting the work done, <laughs> getting the work. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's a lot of work. We yeah. were on the same page. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, that's good. Yeah. Um, what did you check? Are you looking for one child or did you check the box for multiples? This one. We checked the box for one. Uh, she'll probably be different <laughs> on this. Like I ultimately, I, I mean, I could have a lot of kids. So I, but I don't want more than one at a time. So we both were agreeing on that and we'll have to come back to the drawing table later to see if we want to continue. We'll to do a follow-up once you uh, have to. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Because exactly. yeah. it's, well, it's going from one to two, one to two or is one different. to three is, one, is yeah, different. Yeah. It's all, I think, diff- yeah. difficult. Like, I feel like one to three at the same time, ooh, that would have been, yeah. That's a lot. Yeah. That's a lot. Walk us through, so you're going through private adoption, which you already said in the beginning, is more expensive. It sounds like it's a more, I don't know, curated experience maybe, or a more one-to-one experience. I can use the word boutique. Boutique? Is that, Fair. how would you, yeah? I mean, I don't, I don't think it's first. I mean, okay. it's, it, in my opinion, you're paying for the experience and the wealth of knowledge that they have. And not only being able to guide you, but the trust that they are generating in the industry of, you know, caring for birth mothers and making sure or helping them make the best decision for their family or for their child that they're you know going to have. So that's how I look at like we're spending money and we're getting a, at least in my opinion, a ton of value in what we're spending on that. And they really take care of the birth mother. That's what I liked. They just don't say, you know, after the adoption process is over, they don't leave her in the dust. They you know, offer her therapy, they check in with her. That's what I really liked about it. So what is all of this costing? Because we are a financial literacy podcast. Yeah. So let's get into the numbers because you have- I know James, I know James knows them. I know. I'm sure there's a bunch of spreadsheets. <laughs> so the good thing, well, I guess the good thing for us is not everything is due up front, right? Yeah. So I believe it's around they and of course they have different packages, but they have like mm-hmm. You know, I don't want to say basic because that feels weird, but they've got like your entry package 
they've got your middle tier package and they have like, you know, your soup deluxe package, if you will. Okay, wait, what do these packages entail? Like, why are they different? Because I did not expect you to say that for starters. Do you get a better kid with that? Like, right, the one that- like, the IQ on this like baby. Like one that doesn't cry. It has nothing to do with the kid. It's about like how much services they will offer you. So like the whole videography thing is an example. I believe it's baked into oh. one of their higher tier packages where they'll put together okay. videography services for you and, you know, make sure oh, they'll make sure your website's beautiful and pretty and whatnot versus oh. you. So you like know. turnkey versus DIY. Exactly. And then I know it's a pop tier package. They handle all travel planning. Because, you know, we're going to have to ultimately go somewhere. I think mm-hmm. they take like, the hotel, transportation, all of that. Okay, so which package did you choose? Oh, you come on. <laughs> okay. I, was like, I, I already knew who was the DIY package, first of all. Yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> like, I went DIY. All right, they went with the basic package for those of you that don't know Lauren and Brandon James. Well, it's more hands on. Like, I love writing, I love scrapbooking. So, this was kind of right up my alley. Like, I had the website mm. finished in like a week because I just like writing and um, you are a writer, so <laughs> yeah. I love the profile. I love scrapbooking, so that's basically scrapbooking. So I wanted to be more hands on, mm-hmm. and then the cost. that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's okay. So, Payment plan. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. So they split it up. Uh, I think we went with the, like the plan that was around twenty four thousand dollars. The to like get your name, not even on the list, but to mm-hmm. say, you know, we're putting our skin in the game. There was a ninety five hundred dollar payment. And then once you pay that, it kicks off a six month clock. Mm -hmm. So by the time your six months is over, you not only need to have like everything legally done for the adoption, like all your clearances, all your paperwork filled out, but you also need to pay the remaining balance on like the $24,000. So we have until I think it's September 7th to like make that final payment. Once you make that final payment, everything's been approved. That is when they start. I think, yeah, auditioning is not the right word. That's when they, they start they like, call it going live. yeah, showing you to prospective mothers. Okay. Okay. So you could be from start to finish, not finish holding the child, but start to finish of the process, all dues paid within six months with the agency that you've chosen. If you decide to pay everything, like if you just say, you know, I'm just going to pay the 24K right now or whatever the charges, they'll start auditioning you right then and there. You okay. obviously, before okay. you can legally adopt, you have to have your adoption package completed. But, you know, if right. you just say, you know what, here's 24K, let's go ahead and get this process started. You can be introduced to prospective mothers right then. Okay. So wow. here, here's a question that I get, like I said, I always go the finance route, obviously here. Um, do you know if, for example, someone wanted to adopt a child and they don't, you know, have the $24,000 to be able to give it within that six month period, are there loans available? Yeah. So, yeah. So they're, well, they're grants, but those grants are typically divvied to, you know, middle and lower income. Like, you know, those grants aren't going to give someone making, you know, six figures a year, like, oh, let me give you money to adopt this kid. Right. Uh, there's also like specific, uh, I get a lot of like SoFi advertisements because that's, you know, our primary bank. So there's like specific like loans or family planning loans that you can do that have, I don't know if it's an interest rate that's subprime or not, but they will offer you, you know, up to a certain amount to be able to, you know, put towards the fees for us and our situation. I know we we wanted to, like, remove debt from the table. So from us, we had already like we were saving for this to begin with. And then when we had the conversation with the adoption advisor, she said, like, hey, you know, we're obviously very popular. You've done your research. If you are serious about this, you know, you want to make sure that you can get on this list as soon as possible. So we already had like, you know, that 9,500 allocated to this process. And so we are like, okay, let's go ahead and begin right now then. Got it. Do you, I know a lot of, especially in the tech space now, there are, um, the companies will help with IVF treatments, fertility treatments, adoption. Do you have any benefit like that with the company that you're currently working for? Don't get Lauren started, but yes for fertility, no for adoption services. Oh, that sucks. Yeah. yeah. Okay, we're not going to pour salt in the wound. All right. We should write you should write a letter, Lauren. Yeah, you should write a letter. That stinks. Like why? But okay. Um 
Okay, so you saved for it. You know you have to have the payments done to be presented to the mothers or the families. What happens then? Um, like if somebody chooses you, can you then still say no? Or you're like, ah, this one doesn't feel right. Like, how does that work? Well, I hope you can say no. Well, they, I mean, yeah, but. If you can say no, they, they try to really make sure you're being with, matched with someone that you are going to say yes with. Yeah. They really Just don't want to scenario where you're declining uh, a future child. They, they like how they structured is that's why they ask a lot of those detailed questions just to make sure like when we present you an offer we know or we have a high likelihood that you're going to accept that you know mm -hmm. that that mother saying we choose you as you know my child's family and then what do they anticipate the wait time is because i've always heard you know you could be waiting for a year or two years and you just literally don't know so, is the agency yeah. guaranteeing something no, to you no. or? It, it, it's it's we when you know the interviewer came yesterday we were talking to her about it because you know she's gone into a lot of homes and you know there are things that can make you quote unquote more attractive but there's no real you know average time frame she said you know she's seen like three or four months and then she's seen two years uh she did identify there are certain qualities and characteristics that do help so being a young family helps you know we have a young child so that is seen as attractive being like oh i know my sibling's going to go up with another sibling already so you know that's you know more attractive uh so certain things like that you know being you know financially stable can potentially help as well but you know really there is not an average time frame where hey you know you make your final payment we guarantee three to six months you'll have a kid because right. you just can't do it are is, you having to show your financial statements how course. do they know to the agency not the parents or both uh, you, no not the parents to the agency yes the agency i don't know right. if they disclose that to the moms or not mm -hmm. But they definitely, <laughs> yeah, you have to provide them with your financial statements, record of and proof of employment and salary and all that information. But we also have to, um, they ask you for a birth mother donation. Oh, yeah. And that is advertised. So um, what is what is that? So they told us that the average range was five to $10,000. So we went in the middle of uh, 75. Okay. So, so that is what, the money that you would give to the mother after the adoption. We sure. would, yeah, we would give that money technically the to the agency. Mm -hmm. They, we okay. wouldn't like write the mother a check because you know, okay. not saying yeah, whatever that, happened, that would but be, you want to protect yeah. yourself. So yes, we give yes. the agency, and the agency divvies it out as they see fit to the mother for medical expenses, transportation, yeah, uh, maybe basic needs. Maybe she needs food, shelter, or something like that. Okay. So she will. Do looking at our website and seeing all these people and what their donation is. Oh. Now do they have like a max can you like you know state a max time frame that like if it takes past this time frame then we might not be you know interested anymore? Since no, there is no guarantee. Because I mean we did our due diligence prior to signing the paperwork. There's no like refund policy. So you can't just say, you know what, we're good. We're you know either we're going to, you can't say, you know, we're going to go through IVF as an example. Can you hand us our money back? They're going to look at. They did say that if I happen to get pregnant, um, they will hold our money for two years. And then give it back? No. And then we can still pursue the adoption. Oh, yeah. But yeah. still, there's no like. Oh, okay. <laughs> so you could walk away, but you would be losing anything that you've already paid. Exactly. Like, I'm yeah. thinking, you know, what if something changes circumstances wise where you're no longer. Quote, what if you something changes and you are no longer quote unquote qualified in their minds to be adopting? Uh, yeah, heaven forbid, obviously, but no, we I don't have a specific answer for you on that. Just of everything that we read, it's like, hey, not necessarily buyer beware, but yeah, you need to make sure that you're committed to this because there's you know not a scenario for a refund. Because like in my mind, I'm just thinking things like you know you know God forbid you know none of this obviously occurs, but like. If one is something happens and one of you guys becomes, you know, somewhat disabled for for any reason, mm -hmm. you know, that's obviously a huge change to your family dynamic. And it might not be the ideal scenario to, you know, bring on bring another on child. Another child. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. We'd probably lose the money. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say yeah, the money would be gone unless, you know, 
unless you pursue like legal parameters to, to get it back based upon a situation change that is unforeseen and unpredictable. That makes sense. How did you feel about the donation for the mother? Is that something that you had heard about before you started the process and doing your research? It's not something I was aware of. Um, so I'm also wondering like, so you, the ideal scenario is the five to $10,000. Do you feel like you would maybe be more readily chosen if you gave 10,000 versus 7,500 versus 5,000? Like, have you thought about any of that or am I spiraling here? No, you're not spiraling. <laughs> uh, I think we wanted to make ourselves as attractive as we possibly could to a potential birth mother, not saying that they're going to choose a family solely based on how much, you know, it's temporary, how much temporary financial support right. I can get. But we still wanted to, you know, not come off as like being unnecessarily frugal when on average, you know, the birth mother expects or should expect this range of, of money or, or financial assistance. So is that something you then also budgeted for or you had to like figure that out after the fact? Yeah. So one, I, I you know, being black, I come from extremely proud people. Right. And we didn't like growing up, we never asked for anything. So for me, it was a big step out of my comfort zone to go to the fundraising route. Luckily, Lauren has definitely pushed and nudged me forward. So uh, we used our circle, our network, friends, families, neighbors, and we went the the fun route, fundraising route. And we dedicated a pledge to say, like, hey, any amount of money raised would go directly to the birth mother up to this specific number. So the 7,500 uh, goal. Uh, we've actually hit that goal. We've gone way past that goal. Oh, which congratulations. Is, yeah, appreciate it. It blows my mind. But, like, that that's what we did to say we want to be able to support the birth mother. We had a trivia night. So we had people over. We had food and drinks. had trivia. And then we asked, hey, if you can donate money. Please do. Oh, yeah. That's so fun. I love that. Well, and I think, too, I mean, it makes sense. We all know how expensive it is to have a child, especially in the United States. So for somebody who's already giving up their child, you are probably assuming in most cases finances are, you know, important. I mean, they're, they're important for everybody. But then to leave the hospital without a baby and a, a bill, like a huge bill, I mean, to have that help. I think is, is really, um, I never knew that it existed, but it does, it makes sense. And I think it's something very generous that adopting families can do. So thanks for enlightening us there as well. Um, I want to be respectful of time. We like to leave our listeners with some, something that they can walk away with, something that they can take with them. So for any of our listeners who are looking at adoption, have friends or family that are looking into adopting, what message or advice would you like to leave with them today? Good person. See if ours is the same. I think um, you, <laughs> you really can both have... leave one if they're not the same. <laughs> for adoption, you really have to, I would do your research and make sure you're on the same page. I wouldn't go into it lightly. This is something that you have to be committed to. Is that the same as yours? No, but it's a very good one. I mean, you, you like they tell you of the emotional troubles that you could have. Like, say for an example, you get chosen by a birth mother, and then she has a child, and she says, "You know what? I, I would like to parent my child now." And you're like, "Oh!" So you have to mentally prepare yourself for having that kind of loss, and it is a loss for sure. So, like, like Lauren said, you got to be intentional. It's and, a loss, but it's also a well, yeah, lost for gain. Yeah. Like they they say not to call it a failed adoption because we always want the biological parents to have their own biological kids, and we want to be able to support them as much as they can. So that's why they said it's not really a loss. I mean, it's, it's an loss. emotional yeah, loss. Yeah, it absolutely yeah. would be an emotional loss. So you have to but go. But a gain for the child to be yes. with, their emotion, with their biological parents. From a financial standpoint, we would lose all the money that we donated to her. Oh. So she can take the money and now could she choose another family or she would just, she would only keep the money if she kept the child herself? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I would uh, I would hope if she can't take the money and 
and like run to another family and then do it again and, and then, run to another yeah. family. I think they will probably have some safeguards against that. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. even the plot twist of she can keep the money if you're not taking the child is really interesting. So mm-hmm. buyer beware because Yeah, and, yeah. and that's one of the reasons why we went with this film because they like they they also do their own vetting process of the mothers as well. Mm. Wow. Well, definitely a lot of research that needs to be done. Um, I know we only scraped the tip of the iceberg with with the information that you've given us, but um, definitely a lot of insight, a lot of knowledge. Um, we will link any and all resources that you'd like to share. Um, I know we didn't name the adoption agency by name. I know that there's, I'm sure, hundreds, if not thousands in the United States. But thank you for giving our listeners a glimpse into this very intense process where you have to do a lot of research and really be intentional about the direction you want to go in. So thank you for sharing your story with us. We wish you nothing but the best in this journey and cannot wait to see your beautiful family grow through this process. So thank you for sharing with us today. Once he or she arrives, definitely have to do a follow-up. And a play date. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. I was joking. Like, you know, your son and our son, they could be brothers for sure. I, they totally could, especially because we just are starting to change Roman's haircut. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Henry was cooler in the haircut department than Roman for a long time. So now we're keeping up. Um, well, James has hair, so he's a little bit more up to date on the stuff. You know, I, I haven't had hair for like 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> there's that. So, but we're excited to see the progress. We'll definitely be linking the blog, Lauren, that you're writing so people can can stay in touch. And if the donations are still open, we'll link that as well for anybody who would like to uh, to donate to you growing your family. So we can't wait to see what happens and wish you nothing but the best. So thank you so much for being with us. Thank you all so much. Thank you.